Well, good morning, everyone. Let's stand and worship together today. to sing some Christmas carols together during this season. And I just wanted to mention, some of you may have already seen it, but Vespers is being streamed um, right now through Milliken's website and through YouTube and Facebook. That is an experience that I know our family loves to be a part of, and I know many of you do as well. So if you haven't seen it yet, it is being streamed today at 2 p.m., so please feel free to check that out if you can. If you can't see it today, it's also going to be out there through WAND closer to Christmas Day. Um, so let's continue just to sing and be in the Christmas season together as we sing It Came Upon the Midnight Queen.
Amen. You can be seated.
Let's stand and continue in worship together.
What a special time we're living in during this season of Christmas, even with all its limitations and distractions. It is always a good time to gather together around the word and rehearse that first Christmas account. It's also a time when many times we reflect on our childhood or things that have occurred in the past Christmases. And I would like, before I get into the message this morning, just share a couple of things. I remember when we were growing up and we would put out one strand of lights on the front porch. And I thought we were living in the most important house on the whole street. It seems like our house was decorated more than anybody else's, but it wasn't, but it was our string of lights. We all have those precious memories, those precious things from Christmases past. But I'd like to share with you what I call one of my Christmas miracles. Now, not because I had anything to do with it, and not because it's a miracle as the Bible calls a miracle, but after I share it with you, you'll realize that was a miracle. Our church has a program on Wednesday nights for children starting age three through high schoolers. The younger programs, it's called Awana Clubs. And the clubs have a cubby program for three and four-year-olds, a sparks program for five-year-old through second grade, and then third through sixth grade, truth and training, and then our junior high trek and then high school youth ministry were both junior high and high school joined together under Pastor TJ's leadership. But I want to tell you about my experience with this church's Sparky program. Once again, five-year-old to second grade. And if you're looking for a name that describes five-year-olds to second graders, it is the word Sparks, full of energy. They wear everybody out that they're around, but that's how God wired them. I remember a number of years ago when Janet Langston was our Sparks director. And she said, Don, since you're our Wana missionary, why don't you come early part of December and share with our Sparkies in their devotion time? I said, no problem. And she was going to give me up to 15 minutes with five-year-olds through second graders. So I began to pray. I said, Lord, they can be a handful. Please, what do you want me to share? And this is what the Lord had me share. I was beginning to wonder how many of those boys and girls come from homes where the word of God is never opened on Christmas Eve and the account from the word of God ever read to them. So that's what the Lord led me to do. So when I got ready to share with the Sparkies, and there were about 20 or 25 of them, I decided that I was going to sit against the wall so none of them would be behind me. So they would be in front of me so I could share with them. So I got up and I said, boys and girls, as I come over and sit against the wall, would you come and sit on the floor with me? Because I would like to share with you what we do at our house every Christmas Eve. So we sat down and here's all these smiling faces full of energy. I opened the word and took about 10 to 15 minutes just to read through the account of Scripture, and guess what? No one made a sound, and no one moved. I got up, I left the room, and I said, Hallelujah! Because I wonder how many kids long for the awesomeness of having the Bible read to them of the Christmas account. So that's why I consider it a real miracle. For all these kids to listen so attentive for so long as the Word of God was read. If you would, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be turning to a number of passages. But I want to give you two that if you want to turn to them ahead of time, when we come to them, you can follow along. The first one is Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Luke 8. Verses, I'm sorry, Luke 2, chapter, chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And the second one is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. John 14, 1 through 6. 
Well, let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it is your word. It is that time of year we focus intently on the coming of the Savior. Thank you that the word has already been proclaimed as we've sung it together. Thank you for the truth that we were able to share and to give back to you in song. Now I ask that as we rehearse your word, your spirit would guide and direct us, help us to understand your word and apply it to our lives in a way that we can live it to honor and glorify you. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There have been many historical events that have occurred in my lifetime and before that has taken the headlines of not only the U.S., but has captured the attention of the entire world. Let me share three of those with you. In 1903, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, when the Wright brothers performed their first powered flight, lasting a grand total of 12 seconds. They were in the air for a distance of 120 feet. And because of that first flight, look at what has evolved from air transportation. Zigzagging across our nation and around the world with people and products and cargo. But the flight lasting 12 seconds and 120 feet seemed to have been small compared to today. For a 747 has a wingspan of 212 feet. They were barely in the air, more than half the wingspan of a 747, but it caught the attention of the world. Second of all, around 1880, thereabouts, give or take a few years, when electricity became commonly used around the world. I don't know about you, but I enjoy having electricity in my house. I enjoy something to charge my phone. I enjoy something to be able to keep communication, either radio or on the internet or the TV. I do not enjoy being without electricity. For those who were living in this area in 2006, you will remember the ice storm to where many of us were without electricity, some for up to two weeks. I like electricity. Thirdly, my favorite, I remember when I was 16, sitting in front of the TV. It was on a Sunday night. It was about 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. And there, Neil Armstrong stepped out of the lunar module and became the first man to set foot on the moon. These are things that captured the headlines and the attention of the entire world. So here we find ourselves at Christmas. And I want to share with you that that first Christmas was so momentous. As we look through the scriptures and as we realize its impact, it is the thing that brought the world to the point of where it seemed like it was the day the earth stood still. I would like to share with you some scriptures that reinforce this truth. And in a moment, we'll be reading Luke chapter 2, 8 through 14. But if you just look at that passage, you'll realize that the day Jesus was born grabbed the attention of heaven and earth itself. The things we read in this passage it says that the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds at night. We read that a star appeared like no other star. And I am of the personal persuasion. It was not a comet. It was not the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn. It was not the galaxies merging together in some far distant spot in the universe. I am convinced it was a divine established star for that occasion. And the glory of the Lord shining brightly around the shepherds in the middle of the night while they're tending their sheep out in the open, that was the day the earth stood still. 
If you have Luke open, Luke 2, 8 through 14, follow along as I read the account. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And you shall, this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth amongst those in whom he is well pleased. Truly, the day that the earth stood still, when God's divine appointment met and flowed into human history. I bring to your attention Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 17. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has set the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. But it's too easy for us to get distracted with all that's going around. And even when things were going normally, it is easy for us to be distracted by the hustle and the bustle. And some of the most busiest times for the church or for families seems to be Christmas when we need to slow down and absorb the truth of the moment. But sometimes it takes a child to remind us what Christmas is all about. Many times the child's perspective helps us who are older be focused. I would like to share with you an account by a four-year-old that helps us to stay focused. What I have here is part of one of our nativity scenes that Nancy and I set up in our home every Christmas. And what I'm about to share with you actually happened recently. The four-year-old had one of these in his house, a nativity scene with Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in the manger. And the account from one of the parents was, as this four-year-old was walking by, he would stop pick up baby Jesus and say, thank you, baby Jesus. Set it back down. Look at the figure of Mary and say, mom. And look at the figure of Joseph and say, dad. What else do we need to be reminded of? Thank you, baby Jesus, for growing to be the savior of all mankind. And God preparing Mary and Joseph for the task at hand of raising the Savior, God's Son. So let's focus now on five words as we move through the scriptures that will give us a panorama, the unbroken view of the gospel from Genesis to Revelation. On the back of your bulletin, there's room there to write down these words and to write down some of the comments and some of the references. These words are promise, prophecy, presence, payment, and again, promise. Let's see what the scriptures say. Let's expand our understanding of what the scripture is saying. And with these five truths, let's see how the truth applies to me and to you this morning. First of all, promise. Genesis 3, 15. We know the account of the book of Genesis. 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We know that the account of Scripture speaks of 24-hour literal days when God created everything in six 24-hour time periods. On the sixth day, he created the crowning of his creation. That's you and me and all of mankind. For the scriptures say that man was created in the image of God. So it doesn't matter whether a person's wearing a mask or not. When you look at another individual, you see someone created in the very image of God, the creator himself. When you get up in the morning and you walk to the bathroom, whatever you see in the mirror, be assured, has been one who is created in the image of God. So now, God, the Lord God, wants to meet Adam and Eve and walk and fellowship with them in the cool of the evening in the garden. Prior to that arrival, as we read the account in Genesis, Satan comes to deceive and trick Adam and Eve. They give in and disobey what God says. Do not eat of the tree I tell you to not eat of. Their disobedience was sin. Our disobedience to the holy word of God is sin. God comes, seeks to meet them, realizes they have disobeyed, and now judgment must be passed. They are going to be kicked out of the garden. Fellowship with the Holy Lord God has been broken. Sin has come into the human race. So we come to Genesis 3.15 and the promise that the Lord God left. The Lord God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, you referring to the Satan representing the serpent representing Satan, and to the woman referring to Eve, and between your offspring and her. He, the offspring of the woman, the offspring of Satan, <clears throat> back up, the offspring of the woman will bruise the head of Satan. And Satan will only bruise the heel of the offspring of Mary, or in this case, Eve. The word enmity means hostility. We realize that all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's always been, Satan has always been the enemy of God and God's plan and purpose. And so God sends a redeemer. The phrase, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel refers to the fact that Mary will be able to give birth to the Son of God who will become the Savior and will defeat hell and sin and Satan himself. To where Satan will cause agony and pain and sorrow and death. So the promise was given in the Garden of Eden. Romans 5, verses 12 through 19, explains it this way. Because of Adam, all are made sinners. But because of Christ, many can become righteous by putting their faith and trust in the finished work of God. Now let's move to prophecy. Isaiah 7, 14. The prophecy is a prediction of that which will come to pass. Isaiah 7, 14 Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This prophecy, written 700 years before Christ was born. The name Emmanuel means God with us in the personage of Jesus Christ. There are many, many more prophecies. Some Bible scholars believe there are dozens. Some believe there are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament alone that point to the birth of Christ. Let's now move to presence. Where the Son of God stepping out of glory 
into a sin-sick world. We turn our attention to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He came for the purpose of saving his people from their sins. Mary, while visiting Elizabeth, her cousin, before she gave birth to the Son of God, declared in Luke 147, God my Savior. Joseph, before he took Mary as his wife, had a dream, and an angel spoke to him in the dream, saying that Jesus was the Savior, according to Matthew chapter 1. But let's pause for a second. Like most mothers do when they give birth, holding that precious little baby, you hold their hands and look how tiny they are and the detailed. And as we think of Mary doing that, she was holding the very hands that would one day be nailed to a cross for her sins and for the sins of all mankind. Or how about Joseph? As you know, Joseph was a carpenter. And Jesus, growing up in that home, learned the carpenter trait from Joseph. I wonder if Joseph, now knowing that the Son of God had been born, had he ever thought, I wonder how much will I be able to teach him? But let's take it one step further. Jesus, growing up in the home of a carpenter, probably learning the trade as well. Many Bible scholars believe that that was what he was doing prior to his earthly ministry, beginning when he was around 30. But can you see Jesus in his father's carpenter shop with a hammer pounding away at a nail? One day, a nail will be driven into my hand for the sin of all mankind. The presence of the Lord provided the opportunity for the payment to be paid. I draw your attention to Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Many people in our culture say, God is love. He would never hurt anybody. As you read the scriptures, it says God is perfect love, but he's also just and merciful and holy. And because God is holy, somebody has to pay for the sin. Someone has to pay. In this passage, the word justified means a person or individual declared righteous in the sight of God. That's what happens when you and I put our personal faith and trust in the finished work of God that was provided through Jesus. We are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks upon us, he does not see our sin. He sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. In the Old Testament, it speaks of the Old Testament law as a schoolmaster or as a tutor. Pastor TJ has been preaching recently through the earlier chapters of the books of Ro book of Romans, and it speaks much about the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law is there to school us or to tell us this. There's nothing we can do to match the righteousness of God's expectation in our life. So everything in the Old Testament points to the coming of Christ, to where we look back to his coming. Now turn with me to John 14, 1 through 6, as we talk about the promise. Let not your heart be troubled. 
Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way and where I go. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is speaking these words to his disciples following the Last Supper. As they're gathered in the upper room, just hours before, Jesus is nailed to a cross. Here, the Prince of Peace, Jesus himself, himself begins the passage by saying, Let not your heart be troubled. Only the Prince of Peace has the authority and the capability of bringing that peace to the hearts of mankind. But there's something else here that is such a precious truth. Notice, Jesus says, I go to my father's house and I'm preparing rooms for you. The culture in the New Testament time with Jews were this. A man would be engaged with a wife. And in the meantime, between that engagement and taking the wife as his own into his house, he would go back to his father's house and add another room or two. Like the passage says, I'm going to my father's house. There are many rooms. I'm building more rooms for you. That was his Jewish culture of the day. And so Jesus is using a common understanding that he is going to his heavenly father's home and adding more rooms for all who will become part of of the bride of Christ, those who would put the personal faith and trust in the finished work of Christ. So now we come, after we've looked at these five words, promise and prophecy and presence and payment and promise again. Let me conclude with these comments. That day changed everything as Jesus stepped out from glory onto the stage of human history. It was the day the earth stood still. Nancy and I have many favorite phrases that we love at this Christmas season. One of our favorites reads as follows. He came to pay a debt. We, he came to pay a debt he did not owe because we had a debt we could not pay. He came to pay a debt he did not owe because we had a debt we could not pay. John 1.14 reads, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Grace that saves us. Truth in his word that instructs us and guides us in righteousness. Truly a day that the earth stood still. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we are overwhelmed and we are awed when we rehearse the truth of that first Christmas. And Lord, in the busyness, in the hecticness, and the chaos, and even the confusion of today, help us to stop and ponder that day when God became man and dwelt among us to go to the cross to conquer death and hell itself to provide redemption 
for who would ever would put their faith and trust in the finished work of Christ. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing the doxology together? <clears throat> about you all, but that is one of my favorite songs to sing. And it's not because of the melody or the words, though both of those are wonderful. It's the fact that every time I sing it, it is an experience, because every time I sing it, I sing it amongst a group of people of faith. And that is really powerful. So thank you all for that this morning. Um, my prayer for us today as we leave is that we continue to praise God through any situation that we face. Thanks for being here this morning and have a good week.